semester. It's a real tribute to our former dean and friend, Professor Brian Atwood, that so many people are here today. I realize that he really is a friend to an awful lot of people in this room. On the other hand, uh, those of you who are students, unless you're in this class, probably don't know him. So this is a good chance to uh, make his acquaintance. Brian Atwood has a distinguished career that I won't review all of. But for those of you who plan to go into the Foreign Service, uh, that's where he started out uh, in the 1960s in Cote d'Ivoire in Spain. He became our dean here in 2002. <coughs> and prior to that, he served for six years as the administrator of the United States Agency for International Development during the uh, Clinton administration. In the Clinton administration, he also led the transition team at the State Department and served as Under Secretary of State for Management prior to his appointment as head of uh, USAID. Earlier, during the Carter administration, Atwood served as Assistant Secretary of State for Congressional Relations. Much to everybody's sorrow, uh, he stepped down as dean here in January of 2011, uh, just to go and leave. And he became chair of the Development Assistance Committee at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, in Paris. The write-up for this talk today has a wonderful link, that is the article that was linked to that blurb. Uh, is, is quite a wonderful account of his work as DAC chair. I won't go into all of it. Uh, it's all impressive, but I just want to quote from something that Finland's international development minister said. There's absolutely no doubt of Brian's greatest achievement as the DAC chair, and that is the visionary, determined way in which he widened the discussion on development cooperation to involve all the development actors who actually are present in developing countries as their partners. Now it just turns out that it perfectly encapsulates what his ambition was with this Korea meeting that was talked about uh, in the blurb for the talk today. And so I'm very delighted to have uh, the opportunity to introduce you to Brian Atwood's talk the challenge of creating a meaningful global partnership for development. Right now. Well, thank you very much. I'm <clears throat> delighted that we were able to get this to work. Uh, I, uh, I want to start uh, by perhaps getting a little bit personal about why, why would anyone leave a wonderful job uh, school. Uh, well, it's a long story, and it, it, but it does enable me, I think, to perhaps tell you a little story about what the DAC is all about and why I was attracted to it. I guess we click here. I don't have this one. Sorry. Just do this. You have to do it here. It's going to be a little bit on. Oh, really? You have to do it there. Yeah, this is connected to nothing, which is. <laughs> some of that uh, by way of uh, explaining also what the DAC is. Um, the, the story behind why I became the chair of the DAC relates to a visit I made to Washington uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration. And I was asked to speak to the country directors of USAID, the, the uh, mission directors from around the world. They had an annual conference and I was delighted because I hadn't been invited back for eight years to speak during the Bush administration, so I was invited now, and I, I did it. 
And I met with the acting head of USAID and the person that was number two, whose name is Jim Michael. He's a former ambassador to Guatemala and a former DAC chair. And uh, he knew and they knew that I was going to be meeting with uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in a few days. So they gave me a list of things to take up with her. And uh, on that list, in addition to urging her to quickly name an administrator of AID, because they took a long time before they didn't name someone to that position. But on that list, quite a ways down actually, was you should consider uh, having an American become the DAC chair again. Uh, the story is that in 1999, uh, the DAC, which was created in 1960 by the uh, Kennedy administration, called the, De the Development Assistance Group, uh, mainly to coordinate among donors. A lot of suspicion that part of that was burden sharing, get the other new European countries that were now coming on stream after the Marshall Plan to actually create their own development donor programs. Um, that for, for many years, uh, it was always an American that was the chair of the Development Assistance Committee. In 1999, uh, due to a decision that I made, when the United States had fallen down to about third in gross uh, official development assistance. I decided that we had no right to keep the position, so we didn't nominate anyone to be the DAC chair. And consequently, the three successive terms, it was a Frenchman, a Brit, and then a German. The German had been the chair of the World Bank's uh, executive board, and uh, he's the person I succeeded. So I went through this with, uh, with Hillary, who, by the way, is one, a person who really knows development very well. But when I got to the item about the DAC chair, she said, what is that? It was very simple to explain what it was, because the DAC originated the, the MDGs, which everyone knows from. I'll get into that a little later. But the 1990s, when I was uh, going to their high-level meetings as the head of USAID, uh, we decided to make a political statement called Shaping the 21st Century, the Role of Development Cooperation. And uh, that later was uh, uh, agreed to as a summit statement at the G8 in Birmingham, England, and subsequently became adopted by the United Nations as the MDGs as part of the Millennium Declaration. So the history of this organization is is uh, a great deal of progress. Um, it was combined uh, with the OEC, OEEC, the European uh, Commission, uh, back in uh, 1961 and became the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, it, of course, does resources. It looks at aid effectiveness. And it looks at policy guidance, which is perhaps the most interesting. And it has a directorate of about 130 people who do some very interesting studies uh, on development uh, cooperation. It has subsidiary bodies that cover the environment, cover governance, uh, the International Network for Conflict and Fragility, the Evaluation Network, which is all of the evaluators uh, from the various agencies, the bilateral agencies. And then, of course, it does finance and statistics and, and gender. Uh, these are the six uh, subsidiary bodies where a few times a year, the experts from each of the bilateral agencies and the multilaterals come together to meet uh, on their topic. Um, one of the things that I did uh, while I was the DAC chair was to eliminate uh, one of the subsidiary bodies called the Poverty Network. And the reason I eliminated it was because no one was coming to the meetings. Uh, can you hear me all right? You, because the microphone is just broken. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the Poverty Network um, had created some very important indicators of poverty, and they were generally used by all of the subsidiary bodies. But they were kind of on a search for a mission and they weren't attracting people, so we eliminated them. So there are 24 members 
all member of my, all of the bilateral donors uh, are members. The most recent one was Korea to join about three years ago. And the World Bank and the international organizations are also uh, uh, permanent observers uh, to the DAC and very important contributors. And one of the changes that we made during my tenure was to invite the international development banks as well uh, to attend their meetings. I've already answered the why me. Uh, I want to finish the story though and tell you that about a month later, uh, Cheryl Mills, the chief of staff to Hillary Clinton, called and said, Hillary wants you to be the DAC chair. So that's how it happened. I then became a candidate of the US government after having seriously considered whether I really wanted to leave uh, Minneapolis and live in Paris. Uh, I took about five minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm really pleased to be back. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what I really saw, and uh, if we could switch the, thank you, Alex, uh, was the potential uh, to do something really important. And most of what I'm going to say today is at the 40,000 foot level. Uh, but I think if you look at some of this history, you will see why the donors uh, that make up the DAC uh, have been so significant. 3.7 trillion in 50 <coughs> years. How much of that was wasted? I don't think anyone can give you a figure. Some people say 30%, uh, but part of the <coughs> effectiveness agenda is to try to get at that issue. The relationships were mainly north to south, although of course that's not strictly a geographic term uh, because we have New Zealand and Australia as members of the DAC. <clears throat> but we were seen as the donors club and there were allegations that the donors were mainly interested in, in exporting their own values uh, to the developing world. And that's an issue that we had to deal with later on. We made a great deal of uh, progress over time with that $3.7 trillion. But they, we made the progress, I think, because of relationships that were created and trust that was engendered. Uh, you have to make it clear that the development agencies within these Western governments were the only agencies whose success depended on the success of their partners in the developing world. So they had a general interest, yes, in promoting development, peace, stability, uh, which of course is in the long range interest of all Western countries. But they had a real interest in, in developing and in, in creating results uh, on the ground. And indeed, if you, you've got people in this audience uh, who can tell you a lot more about the various sectors, uh, but in the health sector, we. We've uh, eliminated half of a mortality over time. We've created, uh, or we've eliminated half of extreme poverty by now, according to the World Bank. We've cleaned up water and made more water, uh, potable water available. There's a, a lot of statistics on a global basis that indicate that the world would look a lot different if we hadn't invested that $3.7 trillion over time. We've made investments in aid for trade, investments in microeconomic systems that, of course, create investment environments and create trade opportunities uh, as well. Now, official development assistance remains vital. It is only 13% of all flows, but if you could turn the slide, you will see here where some of it is going. Most of it is going to the green line are the LDCs, the lowest uh, income countries. The blue line, uh, sorry, the LDCs are the, the, uh, the blue line. The other uh, low income countries are probably fragile states, the red line. And there's a reason for that, um, because working in fragile states is a very risky business. You may not have made good investments in doing so. Um, there is a factor here that I'd like to talk about more, which is the, the upper middle income countries. This line is going up, and a lot of the reason for that is because of the global economic crisis and uh, an increasing uh, amount of ODA going out as loans 
from uh, countries like Germany and France uh, who are investing in the emerging economies, <clears throat> probably for reasons that relate less to development than in terms of advancing their own interest in these countries, trade and investment. Uh, France's largest uh, recipient country is China, for example. Um, the next slide gives you some idea of how much of this is going <coughs> to LDCs. See how much <coughs> of it's official aid, the rest of it is trade, uh, private charitable donations, uh, private workers' remittances, foreign direct investment. Now these are middle income countries and you see here the trade uh, takes over for development and how small the official development assistance is that goes to these countries. But it unfortunately is growing in my opinion, unfortunately. Foreign direct investment begins to increase when you get to the end of the development uh, continuum. So if you go to the next slide, again, you'll see the percentage of, uh, of GNI in these selected African countries that is ODA, the green is ODA. And again, you see the reasons why Nigeria, uh, who has one of the best finance ministers in the world, uh, is now beginning to invest more of its oil revenues in development. And it needs less development. <coughs> South Africa, all the way up to Mozambique and Rwanda, and these other countries are some of the fastest growing countries in the world. They're becoming very successful, and largely because they're receiving uh, a lot of ODA, uh, but of course that comes with complications as well. Um, the next slide <coughs> is uh, my effort to try to portray what I faced when I took this job, um, there was a, an awful lot of navel gazing within the DAC, worry that uh, new countries were coming online, new providers, the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, and others, were going to be less relevant. They had what was called a reflection exercise and mainly agreed that they had to reach beyond uh, their own uh, numbers, uh, 24 countries in that case. But they hadn't done anything about it. And uh, of course, the problem <coughs> was portrayed perhaps most vividly by an uh, article by Jean, Jean Michel Severino and uh, Oliver Ray. Uh, they called it hyper collective activity. In, in 2010, the ODA level reached its high water mark, about $130 billion. But that didn't count what the Gates Foundation was doing. It what uh, the new providers, uh, some estimate around $20 billion was coming from the Chinese, the Brazilians, the Indians, Chinese being the largest of that group. <coughs> and it, uh, it didn't uh, look at the philanthropic organizations that were contributing to Gavi, the um, immunization fund and the global fund, uh, which were health programs. And of course, uh, there were increasing corporate efforts as well responsibility programs and the like. But what it added up to was a tremendous amount of fragmentation in the effort, and it was driving some of the countries crazy. And the next chart, I think, shows you why. This is just, this is one country, Tanzania. This is one sector. This is the health sector. These are all of the organizations that were working on various aspects of health in Tanzania. And just, it's a vivid slide. It just jumps out at you. Uh, Names, the Global Alliance for Drug, uh, for TB Drug Development, uh, Secure the Future. A lot of them are NGOs, a lot of them are government sponsored, most of them are government sponsored, or have a lot of government money. This is the Clinton Foundation, by the way. So, fragmentation, again, at the 40,000 foot level, was becoming a really serious issue. We had basically an international system that was irrational. It just simply wasn't delivering. <clears throat> there was a new focus on results, but it was complicated by all of the efforts that people were made, making. Now I want to look at the DAC over time because I see and certainly saw because of my involvement with the Shaping the 21st Century Report, a sort of continuum 
of effort toward effectiveness that the DAC had undertaken. After the Monterey Summit on Development Finance, which took place in 2001, I believe it was, um, the summit leaders there not only said <coughs> to find the resources to vote to OVA, <coughs> we also have to manage it better. And that inspired a series of, of high-level forums on <coughs> effectiveness, starting in Rome uh, in 2002, uh, which looked at the question of harmonization. Again, it goes to the fragmentation issue. How could we make it less onerous for our partners uh, to deal with all of the various elements uh, that they're faced with? Um, the Paris uh, meeting, the forum in Paris was probably the most famous because of what is what I call the Paris principles. Principles uh, such as accountability, uh, country ownership. Uh, these were principles that, that had been studied um, uh, to show that this is how one can be effective. You have to do away with dependency, you have to create a system of mutual accountability and let these countries own their own programs. <coughs> so Paris principles became very important, but not much progress was made before the 2008 meeting in Accra, Ghana. And uh, one thing that did happen, the Paris principles were pretty much decided by donors. There weren't very many developing countries that participated in Paris, and not very many civil society uh, uh, entities that participated. But in Accra, that changed maybe because it was in a developing country, but a lot of countries came, and a lot of civil society organizations came as well. And the main thrust of the Accra uh, meeting was, let's get busy, let's get these principles implemented. Um, and uh, there was another thrust, which was the creation of the International Aid Transparency Initiative. And transparency became, uh, and still is, one of the issues that can really change behavior. If I were to try to summarize all that the DAC is, it is trying to change behavior to make uh, development programs much more effective to achieve results. There was uh, <coughs> later, after a crowd, an effort made to assess <coughs> whether the Paris principles were in fact empirically correct. And an independent group of academics and others uh, looked at about 25 countries, and with certain caveats, because nothing is as clear and evidence is difficult to, to uh, obtain in some of these developing countries, they were able to conclude that these Paris principles were the correct principles, that in fact effectiveness did, did relate directly to them. And that report was released in about six months uh, before uh, the Busan uh, meeting, which took place in 2011, the end of November, the first day of December, 2011. <coughs> Later, a, a survey was being uh, undertaken, and some 190 countries initially participated in that, which is an indication that the effectiveness agenda already had achieved a great deal. People say, saw this in the developing world as perhaps the answer to some of the the issues that they faced. The survey was released in the summer before, uh, before the Busan Agreement. The survey showed that uh, of 13 targets that the donors had committed themselves to meet, it met only one. And the, and the one was that they would coordinate their own activities a little better on the ground in country. But they made progress on others. And uh, it also showed that there was a 33% improvement in country systems. So you could no longer use the excuse that you, you can't really go along with the countries and put your money into their systems. You couldn't put it into their budgets. You couldn't use uh, institutions in country. 33% improvement, but only an 8% increase of ODA that was being actually dedicated, uh, being sent through those country systems. That was a major uh, uh, survey. It was evidence-based. It was very carefully done. But it also confronted me and others who were concerned about the success of Busan with a major challenge. 
because if in fact uh, the G77 got together uh, and started pointing fingers, uh, they would be very easily be able to point fingers on the basis of the survey if we hadn't done our job. So I learned that there was a meeting of the G20 uh, in Paris, and I asked to speak to the development working group um, and did a major speech basically explaining uh, that yes, we had failed, but let us look at why we had failed. Was it because the development ministries that were implementing these programs didn't know what worked, uh, what worked best? Or was it because they came from an environment wherein development wasn't the only issue that pe had to, people had to address? They had to deal with parliaments. They had to deal with uh, the uh, auditors who looked at their programs. Uh, they had to deal with a lot of other factors within their own governments. So yes, we have failed, but let's look at the bigger reasons why we have failed, and let's commit ourselves to try to change political will so that we could actually do these things right and, and achieve results. So the, the statement, I think, was well received. It certainly uh, prevented us from having people in our working party on aid effectiveness, which the, from the developing world walk out on us because we hadn't yet fulfilled our obligations. The last thing we did was to issue a statement um, welcoming a dialogue with the new providers, uh, with the Chinese and the Indians and the Brazilians and the South Africans and the Russians. That statement, <coughs> if we can go to the next slide, was my effort to try to conduct diplomacy by committee. The first thing I ran into uh, when we had a draft to be considered, <coughs> we, were, we invited the, uh, the uh, representatives of those countries to the, that meeting. And the first thing that happened was that the Swedish delegate came up to me in private and said, you can't have a meeting with them present uh, unless we all approve and, we, and I disapprove. <coughs> so uh, that was a formal meeting. So I now have these people sitting there at the table and I've got this objection that is raised. So I mumble something about, well, I want to welcome our friends from China and Brazil and India, et cetera, et cetera. We're having an informal meeting today. Uh, they didn't quite understand what that meant. And, but we're here to discuss our relationship uh, with these other countries <coughs> and uh, our hope that we can uh, change the atmosphere and have a dialogue. Well, that worked. I mean, uh, the Swedes couldn't object to having an informal meeting. We weren't able to actually vote on anything. But <coughs> we still were able to discuss uh, the, the uh, the engagement uh, policy of the DAC. Uh, we went to, uh, I went to China with the DAC, the China DAC study group. Uh, I went to India and to Brazil. Uh, the one thing I think that we did in the run up to Busan that was more successful than anything was to get Ban Ki moon and uh, Secretary of State Clinton actively involved. Uh, because what happens when you get Clinton involved was that every embassy in the world took up this agenda. And they went to the foreign ministries and they said, this is important. We want you to go to Busan. We want your foreign minister to go to Busan. We want your head of state to go to Busan. And Ban Ki-moon, of course, uh, as the UN Secretary General, <coughs> offered some cover that the OECD couldn't possibly have generated. The OECD is known as the Rich Man's Club. <clears throat> it's 34 member states. They're all the rich countries in the world. A lot of very significant countries are not members of the OECD. It is not a part of the UN. And so how do we then engage the UN to a point where we can, uh, we can fend off those in the G77 that would like to see uh, only the UN take up these issues? We did it by getting Helen Clark, uh, who was the uh, head of UNDP, former Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, who uh, I had uh, actually competed against to be the head of UNDP at the beginning of the Obama administration. But that's another story. I'm not going to get off on a tangent. But she became a very good friend. And she agreed uh, to strongly support our efforts uh, in the working party <coughs> by funding uh, the participants uh, through the UNDP system. 
So we had the cover we needed from the United Nations. Um, we then started a um, process of negotiating. And this was really complicated. And if anyone reads the Busan Agreement, uh, you will see that it actually reads fairly cogently. Um, <clears throat> but it was based on uh, a number of uh, diplomatic strategies. Uh, one was that it would be, a, it's a voluntary agreement. It was not a binding agreement, but every agreement that's ever been reached on development has been voluntary and therefore very significant uh, because people do, uh, countries do actually commit themselves uh, on paper and endorse these things. We use the principle of common goals, shared principles, but differentiated responsibilities. <coughs> we actually couldn't use the phrase differentiated responsibilities because people involved in climate change negotiations says, that's our phrase, you can't use that. It's really a factor, so we change it to differentiated commitments. And what that meant was that <coughs> we would try to get everyone on board on the principles involved, but that the commitments would be different. And the commitments that the DAC members had undertaken were very specific, they related to the Paris principles. Um, we wanted to move from this concept of the single dimensional aid uh, to development in its broadest uh, meaning. Uh, what that means <coughs> is that it's not just the transfer of resources, it's not just the programs on the ground with your partners, it's also the policies of your country as they relate to development, rather indirectly on occasion, but very directly in the case of things like agricultural subsidies, for example. Um, <clears throat> rules and laws related to <clears throat> illicit flows of, of resources. <coughs> Some estimates that as much as $3 trillion worth of uh, illicit flows exist in Western countries, but there are laws against uh, trying to recapture them and bring them back to the developing world. <coughs> so this, <coughs> this is generally called policy coherence for development. And that's the meaning of uh, this part of the agreement, which basically said countries would have to look at their own domestic policies to see if they contradict development objectives. And of course, uh, we wanted to implement all of the effectiveness commitments already undertaken that hadn't yet been done. We wanted to focus on results at the country level, and this is so important. And then, of course, create a global partnership where we, we create basically a new space for a dialogue among partner countries, uh, new providers, the traditional DAC members, civil society, and the private sector. And uh, <clears throat> all of this was the result of a couple of years of work. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, what we call building blocks, but there were separate groups as part of this working party on aid effectiveness that looked at results and accountability, that looked at transparency, that looked at diversity, <coughs> and reducing fragmentation, the so-called aid architecture issues, south-south cooperation and triangular cooperation, engagement in fragile states. Uh, we at Busan uh, agreed on a new deal for fragile states that we'd be doing fragility assessments and holding them to different, uh, uh, different standards. None of the fragile states, these were self-declared fragile states, which was really quite significant. The, the DAC created something called the International Dialogue as part of its international network for conflict and fragility. And this international dialogue produced uh, a group of states called the G7 Plus. They were about 16 fragile states that again wanted to be treated uh, uh, differently with different standards, but they also wanted to own their own programs. And so this new deal was struck uh, at Busan among a coalition, people don't like this phrase, coalition of the willing, because that's got military connotations, so we started calling it coalitions of behavior. <clears throat> Nonetheless, um, that was a very significant agreement on fragile states. A lot of discussion about climate change finance this is a complicated issue in the climate change negotiations themselves. There are a lot of people in the developing countries want to see what they call additionality. <clears throat> they want additional resources, not ODA resources. And uh, 
And prior to Busan, I had to talk the Secretary General of OECD out of a press conference where he was going to announce that $22 billion of our ODA had been used for, uh, for climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. And I said, will you just wait until after Busan because the South Africans, were, which were about to host the Durban Conference on Climate Change, were pushing for a statement in the Busan Agreement on Additionality, and most of the Western countries didn't want that. <clears throat> so he did put off his press conference and held it in Durban instead, which was good. And we had, again, a huge conference on, uh, on effective institutions in the Philippines. And of course, <clears throat> we had, again, a lot of discussion. We had something like 45 different representatives of the private sector in Busan, and most of them came away saying this is the first time the development community has actually reached out to the private sector. It's becoming an increasingly important factor, and of course, uh, a lot of ODA is used to encourage private sector investment uh, uh, in developing countries. So the next step after Busan, uh, the agreement, uh, it, was, it was an interesting uh, three days, uh, the most intense three days I've ever experienced. We had 160 countries there. <clears throat> we had uh, all of the emerging uh, economies there. We had civil society, 500 members of the civil society. The civil society actually participated in the negotiations, the first time that's ever happened. And then we had the private sector as well. And uh, the first day of the conference, uh, the uh, Manchester Guardian came out with a story saying that the Chinese delegation has declared that it will not endorse the agreement uh, in Busan, no matter what it is. <coughs> and the Indians were holding us at, at uh, arm's length, and the Brazilians uh, as well, although they were all there with very big delegations. So the <coughs> it was a real challenge, and a, a, we were pretty depressed after the first day, trying to figure out how we could turn this around. And um, we realized that the UK Secretary of State was in Beijing. So I called his representative into my office and we put language together <coughs> and suggested that he raise it at a very high level in China, which he did. And uh, before we knew it, by the evening, we had an agreement uh, that the Chinese and, and the Indians uh, agreed to. The Brazilians had already come forward and, and said they would agree to the the language even before this separate paragraph was put in. The separate paragraph basically said that we do share these principles and these common objectives, but we do so on a voluntary basis, and we, the South-South donors, are different from the North-South donors. None of that was a surprise, uh, and we found it, uh, frankly, easy uh, to accept. I did. However, later in the day, we found out that <coughs> The Secretary of State, who had given a speech that day and was on her way to Burma, uh, her lawyers uh, decided to ask a number of questions about that paragraph and perhaps got the Australians, who were represented by the former Prime Minister, Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd, uh, to basically say we, we need to negotiate out some of those words, like the word voluntary. And we tried to explain to them that the whole agreement was voluntary, so why did it matter? <clears throat> and uh, it was it was pretty tense and heated. Eventually, they all they caved, and we had an agreement, and uh, it all worked out very well in the end. <clears throat> so then, the delegation to create this global partnership was given back to the working party, the DAC working party, and uh, they had six months to do it, <clears throat> and it was. Again, it, it was intense trying to decide who would represent DAC members on the working party, uh, who would represent partner countries, uh, what the role of the private sector was, and, and the like. But they got to July 1, which was their deadline, and uh, in fact had reached an agreement on just about everything except the co-chair of the steering committee. Uh, the three co-chairs were a DAC member, a new provider, and a uh, partner country. <clears throat> I very much wanted uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iwela from Nigeria to be the, the partner country representative. 
the African Union was having a big dispute <coughs> over the leadership of the African Union. So they said, we don't want any part of this. <coughs> so I called Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Some of you remember she came here to Minneapolis uh, to speak. Uh, I had known her from before. And I called uh, Donald Kabaruka, the president of the African Development Bank, and I said, you really have to try to get the African Union to change its mind and to nominate uh, Ngozi. Ngozi was the candidate for the World Bank, uh, who everyone was very impressed by, and she's, she, they should be. Uh, she's just fantastic. And uh, in the end, it worked out. The Africans said, we want to hold our place, give us another month, and we'll come back. And in the end, uh, we had what I call the dream team. We had the UK Secretary of State, uh, we had <coughs> the Indonesian uh, development minister as a co-chair, and we had Ngozi as a co-chair. Uh, they aligned very nicely with the leaders of the UN high-level panel on the development goals for post-2015, uh, in that Ngozi was a personal friend of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. The Indonesian president is also the head of the high-level panel, and Prime Minister Cameron is the other co-chair of the high-level panel. <coughs> So the steering committee was uh, set up. Uh, it held its first meeting in London just uh, last month uh, in December. And uh, the DAC chair is an institutional member of that committee. Civil society <coughs> challenged us during this meeting because they wanted a co-chair of their own. And most of the governments didn't think that was appropriate. So they actually walked out of the negotiation uh, on the final day. But they walked back in after they had a discussion among themselves, saying that it would do them no good to walk out after all they had achieved. Um, <clears throat> so we, there is a plan for a ministerial meeting uh, in 2013. This is the goal that will be left to my successor. And uh, I think that the potential is here within the next five to 10 years to see this as the space for the development community to discuss issues involving effectiveness and, and the like. It will play a very important role in the actual implementation of development goals. The, obviously, the high-level panel in the UN will determine what those goals will be, uh, but they have to be realistic and they have to be measurable, and they have to be something that <coughs> can actually be implemented, so the global partnership can play a very important role uh, in that exercise. Um, so what's the future of the DAC in light of this? Well, it still has a future, and, and uh, that was indicated when uh, I was able, partially at least, to convince Eric Solheim, the uh, former Minister for Development and the Environment of Norway, uh, to take my place. Uh, he, will, uh, he will be challenged by all of these things, keeping the DAC relevant. It will support uh, the global partnership and if that grows, it may well be that the data will be less important in five to 10 years' time, but it will take time. And as I mentioned before, aligning it with the new development goals and that exercise, uh, defining the purpose and character of ODA. Uh, most people believe that um, ODA was uh, enhanced greatly uh, by uh, setting goals. The development community never had goals before the NDGs, and so, there will be a great deal of discussion about development finance and how to put that together, how whether or not the 1972 definition of ODA needs to change by 2015. And in my very last meeting, <coughs> we had a real crisis uh, because we discovered uh, through the work that we had done uh, with the Working Party on Statistics that a couple of countries, members of the DAC, were really taking advantage of the 1972 definition. The 1972 definition, and I don't want to get too technical here, basically is that there has to be a development purpose to official development assistance, and it has to be concessional in character. And there would be a, a need for a grant element of at least 25%. Uh, so it was to measure donor uh, pain, uh, donor effort 
<clears throat> but the fact of the matter is that no one had ever bothered to define what concessional in character meant. And so without a definition, and with a 1972 discount rate of 10%, meaning that you, if you had a loan of five years and you discounted it down by 10% a year, you would easily make a 25% grant element. But was it really concessional? Uh, as compared, for example, to the rules used by the World Bank on their soft loans. Uh, the fact of the matter is that because of the, the financial crisis faced by many European countries, and because of the easy access to uh, market resources by Germany and France in particular, because interest rates still remain very low, they were able to use this 10% discount rate to put out loans that we feel were not really eligible for ODA, and yet they claimed them to be ODA. And we had on top of that a, an allegation by the European Union that their European investment bank loans were not being accepted as ODA, therefore we were discriminating against them. So I said, what, on what basis are we discriminating? That's a very serious charge. Tell us which other countries are cheating. And they wouldn't name them because they're Germany and France. That's the core of the European Union. All of this came to a head in London, December 4th and 5th, and we, uh, it was, very tense, and it, it was possible that the European Union could have walked out of the DAC. It was possible that the Germans and French would have refused. Scandinavians who have only grant programs and not loan programs could have been purists and said, uh, we won't agree to anything. And so we had to basically uh, set it up, uh, and it, it turned out all right, but I didn't know going into that meeting in the morning whether or not we were going to get an agreement. What we agreed to do was full transparency. They had to reveal the terms of the loans, uh, the terms by which they actually acquired the resources in the first place, and then the terms of the loan itself. So it could be determined by the public as to whether or not these loans were concessions. Um, <clears throat> we also agreed that the Secretariat would have to define what it meant by uh, concessional in character, uh, because in the absence of any definition, <clears throat> the Secretariat was making its own decisions about what was ODA and what was not on the basis of imperfect information. So we tried to solve all of that and we walked away uh, with an agreement, uh, but we also have uh, walked away with an agreement that we would define ODA again by 2015 and in particular this term, concession and character. So, <clears throat> The, uh, <clears throat> the role of the DAC in the future is to continue to reach out to the new partners, uh, to look at this at a country level to see whether or not there's better coordination, to try to rationalize the international system through the global partnership, to invigorate the subsidiary bodies of the DAC, uh, some of them need reinvigoration, and to remain near, I use the word near, the intellectual center of the development community because the World Bank plays a role there too, the UNDP, uh, DAC isn't the only element. But think about this, the bilateral donors are the biggest contributors to UNDP and to the World Bank. So there's a relationship there. They need the bilaterals and we need the multilaterals. That's it, I, uh, <coughs> I feel as though in two years time, uh, I was able to do something, uh, you know, to help the world. I, came back because my daughter wanted to go back to school here. Uh, but I don't think I could have, uh, there was nothing in the, in the coming years that would be anywhere near as important as the Busan Agreement. So once you've climbed that mountain, then there really isn't anything to keep you there. So thank you very much. As you know, these talks will usually begin by people identifying themselves so the speaker will know who is speaking. With the question, please identify yourself. So, uh, yeah. Dr. Levison, what, what would you use as a starting point for defining concessionary? Um, <clears throat> the starting point has to be 
that the donor has to be making a real effort in budgetary terms. <coughs> so when, I, when I had, see every, even within the European Union with a single currency, uh, there are different interest rates in every country and the currency means something different. So there is something called the uh, differentiated discount rate that the OECD uh, determines. Uh, that rate is not dependent on any uh, on this 10% discount rate. It's, it's, a, it's determined on the basis of the value of the currency at the time and the credit worthiness of the country itself and its access to capital. So if you use something like that, I had proposed as a, frankly, as a straw man, because I knew that by that time uh, the, the French and the Germans weren't going to accept it. But I said the DDR minus 25. So that that was generally consistent with the World Bank's soft loan window. And we needed to make sure it was consistent because we didn't want two different systems. And uh, so uh, the, the French and Germans predictably didn't accept that. And so my fallback was to say, okay, full transparency. And uh, that worked. Uh, I, I do think we're gonna have to, it'll be a real struggle to define it because French and Germans feel that the 0.7 commitment, 0.7 of GDP, uh, the UN commitment, is almost a, a law of the land in Europe. I mean, it, it, the European Union has accepted it, and every one of these countries feels the pressure to get there. But they're getting there by using these loans that are really phony. Uh, so we've got to find something like DDR minus 25 that really pins everyone down. And, and that's the concessional side. And eventually, the discount rate is going to have to change to be variable depend, depending on countries' access to, to resources. Jim? Hi, James Ron of the Humphrey School. I have uh, two questions. One is, um, you mentioned one of the achievements of development assistance as um, having a number of people in poverty. I wonder to what extreme, extent extreme poverty. Extreme poverty. Um, I wonder to what extent is that attributable <coughs> to development assistance, and to what extent that's attributable to uh, growth in the emerging economies like the China and India, who did it largely without overseas development assistance. Okay. So that's question number one. You just answered your own question. Okay. <coughs> a, a large part of it is because of what China did in particular, but there's progress in every region, and not all of it. If, if you look at some of these regions, like Africa you see that they are really still very dependent on ODA. So it's, it's economic reform, but ODA isn't just resource transfer refers, it's, it's transfer of knowledge as well. It's, it's relationships, it's partnerships. So I think you can't dismiss the contribution that ODA made uh, to reducing that by half. What, would, you, would you put a figure on that? What's, what percentage of the extreme poverty reduction is attributable in one way or another to ODA? I don't think there's ever been a study, but I think that uh, more, by far more people have been pulled out of poverty in China because of their policies uh, internally than through uh, other means. But China continues to be a recipient of ODA, and they've used some of that to implement the policies they've put in place. The China DAC study group actually did a study of the Chinese uh, internal poverty reduction efforts. A large number, I mean, a, a large part of it is because they have a relatively authoritarian government that's able to implement these things without too much debate, uh, without much, too much controversy. But a large part of it, it relates to uh, relationships they've had with other, with other countries. I mentioned the French, uh, the Canadians have a huge program, the British have had a huge program in China. Only the U.S. has had a program in China because it was prohibited. <coughs> By law, uh, so so I, I, it's very hard to tell, and I have never seen a study that would show that. But I do think you know uh, too many people go around and simply say, well, it wasn't ODA; it was just economic reform. It was ODA played a strategic part in it. I can't tell you what percentage. Okay. Second question is, um, as you know, human rights became mainstream throughout the UN um, in the course of the. The, new, the first decade of the new millennium. But DAC still doesn't break down its um, aid in, in a human rights category. That is, it's, it's still difficult, if not impossible, to tell how much of the $130 billion 
you know where the state of debate is on that within the DAC? Yeah, there was quite a push by civil society uh, on this concept of rights-based approach to development. And of course, quite a push by the subsidiary body called the Governance Network. Uh, mainly, the, their main focus is on effective institutions, <coughs> democratic institutions. But there isn't a, an ODA marker for that. Uh, my guess is no more than 20%, uh, because frankly, there are two two reasons. Uh, first, it's it's difficult for development agencies. Uh, they, they don't want to get into politics or political institutions, and I think they would have to do that much more than they have done. The other aspect of it, though, is that it's uh, quite difficult to evaluate results. I mean, you can count, uh, you can look at quantitative results in the areas of health and environment and other things, but it's a qualitative uh, uh, assessment and evaluation that's needed for democracy programs. And again, you're dealing with bureaucracies. <coughs> bureaucracies uh, are really uh, risk averse. And it, I think that's the big issue with rights-based approach and using uh, ODA for democracy programs as well. Uh, it has to be overcome. There's a new uh, report out, and the report focuses mainly on accountability. If civil societies are strong, governments are more accountable. And, uh, uh, but uh, so, so a lot of good policy guidance has come out on this issue. I gave a speech uh, at the Open, uh, what's it called, the Soros uh, Open Society Foundation in, in Washington uh, a few months ago on this issue, and basically raise some of these same points. But it really hasn't been, uh, there's, when I say a marker, uh, there's a marker now for climate change investments, a marker for uh, gender, uh, but there's no marker on human rights expenditures. Uh, so we don't know exactly how much has been spent, but I would guess no more than 20%, maybe not even that much. In fact, I think there are some statistics in that, in that study. Um, I'll get that out. Jim Peters, I recently retired from the Learning Abroad Center. I wanted to back up to a definitional question that's uh, been stimulated by a lot of thinking about the term sustainable development, which strikes me as kind of a redundant term. That if it's not sustainable, it's really not development, it's something else. It's capital spending or whatever. Um, but when I, I start getting very discouraged, and I think that, that way because I'm not sure there are any countries. So my question is whether there's any kind of consensus in back about what development is, and uh, if you can cite any examples of successful countries. Well, in those uh, terms. maybe <coughs> the phrase that Harry Boyd always uses is that uh, democracy is a journey, not a destination, would be applied to development as well. Uh, there's always the possibility that countries can be thrown back democratic processes can be perverted and we find ourselves back at square one. Uh, but the fact is that sustainable development as a phrase has been used in a variety of ways. Mostly it's been captured by the environmentalists uh, who say that unless you pay attention to environmental considerations, natural resources, etc., you're not going to be able to sustain economic growth. But here's my big point. Mostly um, the world has looked at economic growth as the most important indicator. That attitude is changing. People are now looking at the quality of life. Uh, the Bhutanese government has something they call a happiness indicator. Uh, the Better Life Index that the OECD puts out looks at other aspects of uh, life. And everything is relative. Um, um, Seven percent economic growth in China, uh, the, re the real question is, is it sustainable and how will it become sustainable? The current Chinese government is putting a lot of uh, uh, talk about becoming more of a consumer-oriented society and looking at inequalities. Inequality is also a huge factor in sustainable development, whether in, in fact development is going to be enduring. You can't look at these societies 
with uh, really impressive growth rates and the ones that are ter terribly unequal in terms of where that resource goes, where the wealth is, can't sustain it. And so uh, countries like Brazil have made major progress in um, the inequality that existed in the, the distribution of wealth in that society. That makes their progress more sustainable over time. But again, there are setbacks. I mean, I, Costa Rica now has, you know, for 50 years, USAID worked in Costa Rica. I closed the office when I was head of USAID. It had first world indicators across the board in most factors, health and education and the like. But when I visited uh, with the then uh, president, they were going through an economic downturn, like we all do. And there are exogenous factors there. It's not just because the economic policies of the government of the day. It's because uh, that's why the IMF was created, to try to help these countries that are suffering because of global economic factors. Uh, we're all in it together, and increasingly we understand that now. <coughs> so it's a, it's a very, it, development is a journey, not a destiny. I'm not sure that I've satisfied you, but I think I've satisfied myself. <laughs> <coughs> what do you actually think, Brian, that the doctor would be like to see? What's your point as a <coughs> I hope, frankly, that the DAC will be a lot less important, but it will be important for countries that are responsible for 80% or 90% of all of DA to continue to meet and talk to one another and coordinate better and to create peer pressure on one another. Uh, my hope is that the global partnership will become that space where that also was done there. And the way that peer pressure will be created is by the partner countries themselves who will increasingly own their programs and will be demanding better coordination. There are a lot of interesting issues. Um, the South-South donors sort of stand back and say, you know, we do it better because we offer affinity, because we know poverty, and we offer um, uh, technical assistance that is, is really needed in the developing world. But the fact of the matter is that while India, for example, refuses to accept any development assistance that is tied tied aid because it's a distortion. Um, I don't know what tied aid means. Your procurement processes favor your own country rather than the working uh, partners in the country itself. But India has begun to have its own development program. And lo and behold, it's tying its aid. And so we need to have a broader discussion about these issues, you know, the, the, the trade uh, aspects of these things. And <coughs> Tied aid is a trade distortion as well as a development distortion. So I don't know. I think the DAC, uh, there has to be a place where those kinds of issues can be discussed, where policy coherence can be discussed, where countries like Brazil can feel comfortable coming to the table and saying to Finland, you know, your policy on agriculture is hurting my country. And uh, we don't have a space for that, and that's why I think the global partnership is the hope of the future. And my hope is that in 10 years' time, the DAC will be less relevant and maybe not even needed.